Welcome to the 8th Annual Black Sustainability Summit. This October 6th through the 8th, 2023, we give thanks to all who have made this event possible, those named and unnamed, to each one of our sponsors, from gangsters to growers, to Southern Sayre, all the way to those who have come through to give us support, Aya Paper Company with their donations, Seed to Shirt by sponsoring our t-shirts this year, National Black Food and Justice Alliance for their commitment to coalition work, and Adiki, Aya International Development. We appreciate you, along with Awali, Veganic Homestead. As you tune into presentations, kindly trust and verify what's being shared. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful group. They're gonna share with you all about the state of our ecology and what is really going on Mother Earth as it relates to our pollinators. You all can check out Dr. Darren Spencer's uh, bio on Seabents. We have it there available for you all. We are very proud to have him join us with his team. So I'm going to call you on up here. Okay. Do what you do. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Well, welcome everybody to the eighth annual Black Sustainability Summit. Uh, my presentation is on honeybees. And it's just going to be a brief introduction uh, to what, what we've done, what we do at my farm. Uh, just tell you just a little bit of background on the, on the farm. Okay. We'll talk through just the life of the bees, understanding how a hive works, uh, and then how, we, how we, the bees go about producing honey, and how bee security is food security. Uh, without them, a lot of the foods that we, we eat won't be available to us. So it's imperative that we survive the bees so that we can survive our own food supply. Uh, my farm is down in, in Alabama, just on the backside of uh, Tuskegee University, graduate of Tuskegee University's veterinary school. I just shout out Tuskegee, uh, changed my life. For a young guy from Harlem, uh, living in poverty as such, uh, Tuskegee, again, changed, changed my life by inviting me to their veterinary school and allowing me uh, to do a 30-year career with the USDA as a federal veterinarian. So uh, I do homage to Tuskegee, still continue to work with Tuskegee, have some students from Tuskegee on our team and other uh, HBCUs. So, uh, but uh, again, come a long way from, from uh, starting out in, in Harlem, New York to uh, Harlem Cotton Farms in, uh, in Alabama. Uh, farm is 57 acres. You can say we do sheep and goats, we do chickens, uh, and we do bees. Uh, student down there is about to graduate, the senior uh, at the Tuskegee Vet School, uh, uh, Clio. Uh, is uh, one of the students that's worked at our farm. Uh, and it, it, like I say, she's about to do a presentation on some of the issues that, that honeybees face today. Okay, uh, talk about the life of bees. Uh, bees are social insects. They, they survive in the group, they need to be in the group. Uh, they live together in large, well-organized family groups and they cannot survive without the hive. It's a, it's a sort of a community function dependent on the queen survival. So they engage in a variety of complex tasks and assign responsibilities. Uh, some of those tasks include food collection, which is foraging, uh, communications, they do that through S several different processes, pheromones for one, chemicals that speak to the other bees, and uh, do dancing. Uh, they, they have defense mechanisms, which is their sting, uh, which is a last resort for bees, but that's, that's their defense. Uh, some of the other uh, hive tasks, just back up a quick, it's just child rearing, uh, and then the environmental controls for keeping that hive cool keeping it uh, in the summer and then keeping it warm in the winter. Okay. Uh, we talk, just going to briefly go through the life cycle of a honeybee. Life cycle honeybee starts in uh, 
with an egg. The queen is the one that's laying all of the eggs, uh, primarily if the hive is functioning correctly. That, that egg will go through a larva stage, a pupal stage, and then an adult. And it's the adult that'll come out of the, uh, the, the comb uh, as an adult bee. Uh, the queen is about 16 days from egg to, uh, to adult worker bee, which is predominantly female, all female worker bees, 21 days. And then the drone, uh, which are the males, take about 28 days to go from an egg to a, to a drone bee. Okay. The queen is noticeable by her shape. She's usually elongated compared to other the other bees in the uh, in the hive, uh, and usually a larger abdomen. The worker bees, normal bee, that's the overwhelming majority of the bees that you're going to see in a hive. Uh, and then the, the drone bee of the males, uh, which sole function we'll talk about later is just to, to mate the queen. But the size is the difference. The drones tends to have larger bulging eyes, so you can tell the male from the female. Uh, and like I say, the queen has an elongated abdomen because she's carrying the bulk of the uh, eggs that she's going to produce uh, in her life span. Okay. For the hive, everything starts and ends with, with the queen, the survival of the queen. Uh, like I said, development time is about 16 days. Her lifespan typically is about two, two years for the queen uh, survival. Uh, where she's functional, reproductively functional, is about two years. Uh, like I said, her primary function is reproduction. Uh, she's the one that produces the fertilized eggs, which are drones, and then unfertilized eggs, which are workers. And she's producing up to 1,500 eggs a day, uh, 25,000, 2,500,000 uh, eggs per year. Uh, Main pheromone that she produces, because her pheromones, her chemical signals are what controls and manipulates the hive. Uh, one of those is queen mandibular pheromone, and it impacts their bees and their swarming processes. Uh, their hive identification, so when they're flying out the forage, is her pheromones that lets them know that this is the box that you need to return to versus the other hive boxes that you that you may have in the, in the vicinity of the, of the bees. Uh, hive robbing, again, she's the one that's communicating through her signals, through her pheromones, what the bees in her hive and her colony are going to do. And then her pheromones are also inhibiting some of the other, the worker bees' pheromones and their hormones in that same hive. The worker bees, uh, like I say, 21 days from their egg to, to when they come out as a, as a worker. Uh, their first responsibility is as nurse of bees. Uh, the, the bee will be born, the bee will come out of, of the uh, cell and its first flight as a worker uh, is a poop flight. The, bee, the worker bee will fly out, poop, uh, and coordinate with the sun so that it knows where it is in space, where it needs to return to, and from there on, as it, as it plays the different roles in the hive, it'll know how to go back and forth between its communication with the sun and the pheromones that the queen are emitting in that box can control and regulate uh, how far that worker can go and how it knows where to come back to uh, when it's going to do whatever function it's been sent out to do. Uh, the drones uh, are the males, and like I say, uh, they have one, one function in life, is to mate with the, with the, with the queen. Uh, normally, their survival is usually one season long. They're going to not carry them through uh, the winter because that's just an extra mouth to feed. Their function is to mate. They usually do that in the spring, and after that function is done, that's, that's the purpose of the drone. So they'll remove them from the hive uh, as, uh, as the winter weather comes on, okay? One of the questions that always comes up is, is the Africanized bee versus the European bee. We, in the United States currently, uh, we're, we're not allowed to, uh, to have hives that are Africanized. 
Uh, in my mind, they've gotten a bad rap. Uh, they do a lot of things different, or some things that we need done, they do better than the European B. Uh, they do have a higher defense response. The nature of the, the country from which they come from sort of demands that you have a, a higher defense response. When you're fighting off a hyena or something to make it stay from your hive, you better come with something because they're not going to volunteer to just stay away until you put something on them. And so the African ISB has developed that defense to make sure that it, it convinces you to leave it alone. So it's something we, in working with them, which we do in Central America, South America, the Africanized bee is the, is the common bee at this point. And so we, we can work with them, we just have to understand how to work with them and what we need to do so that uh, uh, we can uh, take advantages of the other things. Like I say, they're more aggressive in everything they do. They're more aggressive in their honey making. Uh, they're more aggressive in, in the queens. Uh, laying eggs and so so what you get from them is usually a larger amount of honey compared to a European bee but again you have to understand how to work with uh, with their aggressive nature and how you can tone that down and that's what they've done in Central America and that's what they've done in South America so that you Africanized bee is now the bee of choice in, uh, in those countries as far as where it is in the United States, even though it's not allowed, it's it, because it's in Mexico and it's Costa Rica and because we live as one uh, continent, I guess, today and you travel and things come from you, so it's impossible to keep them out. So mostly they've invaded the southern part of the United States and then up the, up the west coast primarily. Uh, and I say, I'm, I'm in Alabama and you see some in Georgia. Uh, so they get involved in, in uh, your hive and you can tell, uh, we can tell because they tend to be, that hive tends to be a little bit more aggressive uh, in terms of when it's disturbed, uh, it's resistance to being disturbed. But we work with them, like I say, the, the hive where we've had it, like I say, we've had more honey produced in that particular hive than we have in some of the other hives that, that don't have the African, Africanized influence in it. Okay, I, I do the honey because I'm a small farm and some of the, one of the considerations is how can you make uh, your small farm profitable with limited supplies and we found again that, that honey production for a small size farm is, is, is we found it to be a very good investment. Uh, not just for the honey that's produced but a lot of other products that, that come from, uh, from that hive. Uh, We'll do briefly how that, how that process of making honey goes. Uh, usually, as you, uh, the bees will fly out the forage and they're bringing in pollen, they're bringing in nectar. It's the nectar that they're converting into honey. They, they're digesting that, that, that nectar into their stomachs and they, that stomach breaks down that sugar in that nectar, glucose, uh, into other sugars and they begin that process of, uh, of changing that nectar in, in the honey in their stomach as they're flying back from their foraging activity, okay? Once they return to uh, the hive, uh, they regurgitate the stomach contents, the nectar that they've already started into another bee that's gonna continue that process of breaking that sugar down uh, in their digestive system. And then once that, sugar has gotten to the closer to the consistency that we expect of honey, they'll uh, regurgitate it into a cell. They then begin fanning, fanning that to control the, the water content of, the, of, that, of that frame so that in the end, by the time they seal it, I got some here, by the time they seal it in wax, uh, it's got that thickness, uh, viscosity that we expect uh, for honey to have, okay? But they won't seal it until, until they've got it right. And they're sitting, fanning it, fanning it, fanning it down uh, to cause some of that vape water to evaporate out to get that thickness that they want and that we expect in, uh, in, in the honey. Okay, some of the other things that we get from the honey products, from the bees, 
outside of the honey is, is the wax products. Uh, and wax products go in a lot of uh, other uses that we, other than candles, a uh, wax goes in lotions, balms, uh, candles, so cosmetics. And so that's why I'm highlighting that some of these things, polishing, uh, creams and, and things of that nature can utilize the wax. So that's one of the things that we say in, in addition to, to selling honey from your bee, you can go into the, to the lotions that you can produce from, from, from it, the candles that you can produce from it, and sort of create a small niche market uh, that, that you can, again, take over the internet. So uh, like I say, for an investment of a small amount, uh, usually we tell people about two hives to start out with. You're looking today, if you buy all of the materials, uh, about a thousand dollar investment. And you look at a tractor today, you're looking at a $65,000 investment before you've even done anything. With bees, that thousand dollar investment in two years, you should have enough honey alone to, uh, to make, make, make your investment back. With the tractor, 65,000, you gotta plant an awful lot of stuff and harvest an awful lot of stuff before you're seeing some investment on, uh, on, uh, on that uh, return on that investment, okay? As I came here this morning, a lot of the discussion is, is, is about harvesting and, and, and agriculture. The bottom line uh, is without bees, there's very little harvesting to be done. I was saying people were taking note, I was watching uh, the fruit bar over here on the table. And basically without bees, you can dismiss that fruit bar. You're just not gonna have those fruits in, uh, without pollination by bees. Uh, pretty much what grows on the East Coast, what grows on the West Coast is dependent on bees. So as a food source, without, without bees, uh, you're losing your orchards, your fruit orchards on both coasts. Uh, one of the bigger, bigger users of bees is California. California peaches, nectar, grapes, wine grapes, pears, uh, almonds, pistachios. We, we, we load up bees by the millions, trillions, and, and haul them in trucks to, the, to California so that they can pollinate those crops so that we have that food to eat. So in essence, if you take, take bees out the equation, you're losing uh, all that industry. So even on a local level, if you're doing your, your backyard gardens, uh, your, your backyard fruit orchards, without bees to pollinate those crops, uh, your returns on those crops, how much yield you're gonna get is gonna be drastically, drastically reduced. And say, uh, our connections as human beings is, is that uh, one out of every three bites of food in the United States uh, depends on honeybees and other pollinators. One out of every three bites of food. And the bees are having a hard time with why I go around making this presentation that, that, that our sustainability is quite dependent on, on bee sustainability. So, uh, like I say, in, in honeybees pollinate $15 billion worth of crops each year. And without them, we, those crops don't produce. So we, we've been, from my farm, we try to educate people on the importance of bees, why we need the bees, why our food and our sustainability as human beings are dependent on our pollinators. And bees are probably 60% do the work of the pollinations that's being done. Butterflies, bumblebees, other types of bees. But the honeybee does about 60% of the pollinating that's done uh, in the United States. And so we're dependent on, on them and, and their functioning. Some of the things that have been causing our concerns, uh, climate change, big impact on, uh, on uh, how bees work and function. Just like it's having an impact on man, climate change is having an impact on, on bees. Uh, the change in pests, pesticides, uh, the fact that there's less land space where, where we used to have farms and, and wildflowers now we've got subdivisions instead and so where the bees eat 
uh, in their two mile radius of, of trying to find food sources, if in that two miles was agriculture previously, and now in that two miles it's mostly subdivisions. So it's changed how to, and what we need to do to help the bees survive. Uh, okay. I just, again, just wanted to give you a brief introduction uh, to bees, why I think they're important, why I think they're a big part of what we need to do to be sustainable. And when we talk about the history of, uh, of us as a people, the earliest honey, as I understand it, was found in Egypt, uh, in one of the pyramids of Egypt. So you're talking about a relationship of people of color with honeybees that goes back to the times of the pharaohs. And so what we're trying to do is remind people that yes, if we're talking about food, we're talking about sustainability and our relationship with nature. The bees have been part of our relationship with nature going back to the pharaohs. And so we try to get in with the young people to remind them that yeah, there's, there's a little risk we have, but we have suits today to minimize your risk. But, uh, but the rewards in terms of your garden space and in terms of what your farm can do as a, as a side item uh, market, niche market, where you don't have to compete with, uh, with some of the bigger players, uh, raising bees and producing honey and wax is, is one of the options that we tell f starting farmers. This is one of the areas you may want to consider. And even in the urban setting, we have some people that, that do, roo do rooftop hives above an urban, urban garden. You know, so where, the, where that space is limited, the bees won't come out to try to find victims. Uh, bees don't sting just to be stinging. Bees sting to defend their homes. So, so the, the threat is, is quite limited uh, in terms of how, and you, how you deal with bees around the garden setting, around the farm setting. Uh, you have to actually try to impact that hive directly to get a reaction out of bees. And we use the smoker to, uh, to limit that reaction. The smoker is designed to, to minimize the communication of the queen to, uh, to the other bees in that hive uh, toward their, her pheromones that she's submitting. So that smoke interferes with that, which is why you see beekeepers using the smoker. Try to keep, keep the reaction of the hive to a minimum when you're fitting to go into that box, okay? And we do the same thing with the Africanized. We use a bigger smoker for an Africanized bees uh, than we do a smaller smoker for a Europeanized bee. The smoke is what keeps them, uh, keeps them calmer when they're being worked with, so. But again, I just wanted to introduce the topic to you, introduce it for food for thought. Mm -hmm. That without bees, there's very little food to think about. And so it's important that you understand that. What we do is try to introduce young people. We have a demonstration hive, which we just uh, brought with us. We're trying to make use of it. It's not quite working the way we'd like it to work and that a few of our bees are escaping. But we take our, our projects to the schools, elementary schools, and introduce beekeeping as a concept to kids, what's the importance of bees. So the similar, similar presentation, but a little bit more uh, give and take between the students and uh, and uh, the presenter. So, before last thing before I take the questions, introduce some of my people who come with me. As Mira Smith was one of my students uh, as a freshman at Tuskegee, and as a graduate, now she's graduated. She's still working with help me with, with bees. So, okay. Ooh. And Ms. Betty Summerlin came as a volunteer. Uh, six years yeah. six, and uh, helps me, like I say, she get that, get that suit on and go to work with me and I honor them both and I think, see without the workers, the, the king or queen cannot be successful. So I thank the ladies for, <laughs> so, but, uh, but that, that's like I say, so if you have any, any questions. Uh, so. so I have two questions okay. for your presentation. My first question is, what do you put in your smoker? Uh, the, good, the best answer is whatever you can access that burns. I use pine cones. In, in the south, pine trees are uh, abundant 
and those brown, every fall, those, uh, not cones, but the needles. needles fall off the tree. So we use pine needles in our smoker. Uh, we have cotton as a, as a crop. When that cotton truck comes across, it's blowing all that cotton off the back of that, that truck, hauling it to the mill, cotton mill. You can burn that too. Uh, we use boxes. If you've got Amazon boxes, uh, you can chop up an Amazon box. So that's why I'm saying whatever you can access that burns will burn in your smoker. So like you say, a lot of people junk their Amazon boxes and put them in waste. On a farm, those boxes can serve a lot of purposes as weed controls, as, as pulp burner for your, for your, uh, for your smoker. Uh, and yeah, but yeah, in my place, we have a lot of pine. So we collect up those pine needles and that's primarily what we, what we use as a smoker. Okay, Ivan, thanks for that. And my second question, um, I recently moved down here from Michigan. What we were experiencing in Michigan, um, I worked on an urban farm, it uh, was a loss of bees. Like, our, our whole practice is here. Yeah. So are you experiencing that? We've had, depending on what the circumstances is, we've had uh, uh, where we've lost colony collapse disorder. I haven't had it in my place in, in years. I just gave a presentation yesterday to second year veterinary students about the diseases and pests of the honeybee. And one of the ones we talked about was colony collapse disorder. And I've, I've had it, but it's been years. Uh, most recently, we've had varroa mites as our main cause for our, for our loss of colonies. We just uh, treated our hives for varroa mite treatment uh, this past weekend. But then in terms of colony collapse, the experience I had, I was telling the students yesterday, not only, not only did, the, did the bees just disappear, the honey was left, but the bees disappeared. And, and what I found was that the, the other bees would not go in that box. They would not steal that honey even though it had been vacated. So there's something there that the bees see that we as humans don't see. So I was telling the students, I tried to use that colony collapse, that uh, super box with new frames. The bees would not even go in that. So I just set that box aside. We have a burn pile and that's where we were, because the bees know something's in there. We can't see it, we can't smell it, but the bees see it and they smell it and they won't have anything to do with one of those boxes where that, where that hive has, has uh, disappeared. They won't go in there and get that honey. They don't do what they normally do. And as, we don't know what they're seeing, we still don't, but we know that there's something there that they know, stay, stay away from that, that box. So what do you do with the honey? Destroy it. Oh, For me, yeah. The, again, we, we're doing natural and, and, and the concern, and I use my bees. My bees are telling me something's not right. They don't want to eat it. I'm sorry, I don't want to eat it. That just, that's not science or anything, that's just my common sense. Is if the bees are saying something's wrong with that, they don't want to have any part of it. That's their natural diet. They know if it's good or not. They're telling us by not having anything to do with it, it's not good. I, I don't need no more proof. <laughs> they, they've spoken. As for us, as, as for us to say, hey, is, yeah, I want to sell honey, and I'd love to sell honey, but if the bees don't like that honey, then I don't like that honey. That's just, that just my, my, my take on it. So I didn't. Fortunately, I've only had it once, but it, it, you know, when you're talking 200 pounds, you know, one box and I have 100 pounds of honey, that's a lot of honey. But at the same time, something's not right with that honey, according to the bees. Something's not right with that box, according to the bees. So I don't want anything to do with that honey or that box. So I burnt mine. Yeah. But today, the, the pests that we have more, more concerned with, varroa mite. Uh, and they'll get a, a hive going long before uh, colony collapse will get a hive going today. So, yeah, in the six years transition, that's the difference that, that's going on with, uh, with what we used to have as a concern, colony collapse. The varroa mites will collapse your colony long before colony collapse disorder will collapse your colony today.
Uh, so I talked to a few a few of our presenters actually that are coming up later on and on the next day, and one of them made a comment to me about the fact that they do prairie restoration and they plant flowers and they do all of this to help attract pollinators. Right. But when they moved back home to Florida, to Southern Florida, they were trying to do some more flowers and pollinators. They said that the cucumbers that they planted, mm -hmm. the vines grew, but, but their flower never turned into a cucumber. Right. So seeing more and more of that, right. what what would you say? I mean, I, I know I've heard about, you know, the, the bee drones that they're actually making because of so many, the, the big gap for yeah. actual pollinators. I don't know if you can speak to that. Or well, what's another, what can we do? Huh? That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a good question. The, because the, the planet's changing, climate is changing. And the bees are trying to respond to a changing climate, just like humans are. And, and so, the, like I say, we haven't found a definitive answer on how we're gonna solve this. I tell people, again, do a backyard garden. Just, just a food supply for a bee is where it all starts. And if, we, if the bee can't eat, it can't stay healthy. And unfortunately, again, with the climate changing, you can't do large scale because you, you can't water, uh, you know, 500 acres of land. But you can keep a, a backyard garden, a flower, wildflower bed watered so that you have something there for a bee to find. Bee travel radius, foraging radius is two miles. So that's a lot of land space that it can find forage. So you're saying, Helen, if you even go into Lowe's, you'll see bees in the garden section trying to find some nectar, some pollen. So bees are foragers two miles. So your little garden will, will, will help a bee. So just start something small. Because we don't have big answers for where this climate is going. All I know is we've got to do what little things we can do to give the bees a fighting chance. And, uh, and some wildflower beds, some potted plants, a uh, vegetable garden in the backyard, all of that adds uh, chances of survivability for a bee. And so I tell our young people what we plan to do, give them out some wildflower seeds. So when you go home, you know, encourage them to, to help with this process by planting those little wildflower seeds in their backyard so that the bees can find that backyard and, and find some food sources. So as, as this climate changes, I'd like, to, I'd like to say, yeah, we have an answer. But unfortunately, we're still researching and trying to find an answer. One of the answers that uh, we eventually, I think, America is going to come to the same conclusion that South and Central America. Africanized bees may be our answer. Uh, that's why I talk positively about it, because again, as the Europeanized bee is not withstanding some of these climate factors as well as the Africanized bee. So whether we like it or not, and white, I don't want to use the word white America, I take that back because I'm more than a speaker, but, but the Africanized bee is, is more advantageous and more likely to survive this transition that we're going to. That's why they, they've survived in South America and Central America, and that's why they're using them now. Eventually, we're going to get to a point where we're going to be using a centralized, Africanized bee base and then blending it with Europeanized queens to take some to tame them a little bit. That's where I believe we're going to go. But in the United States, they're, they're Africanized bees are not, not legal in the United States. Uh, we're in America. What's, what's, what you mean? Uh, do, we, do, we, do, so neither, neither are people of color at the border. I mean, so why? I mean, they, are <laughs> they are here, and they're not going anywhere. They are here because because our borders are here. Even they talked on the news, CNN yesterday. Some of the illegals that are coming in through Mexico ran into some Africanized bees. So that if they're if the people are coming. Yeah, the bees are coming. They're here. I showed you the picture. All, you know, the question is, when will we start saying, hey, uh, we've got to take advantage of some of the things that they do. They clean themselves and their, and their mates better. And so a varroa mite attaches to a bee. And just like in, in, like in some of our monkey species, if you're pulling those varroas off, 
and throwing them out, you have a better chance to survive. Africanized bee does that better than the European bee. They're more clean, they're more aggressive in cleaning each other in that box. So some of their, those traits are going to play well for their survival. Yes, yes. In, in, in Alabama, we have to register our bees, our hives, so that they're aware. We have to mark our boxes so that our hives are identified uh, uh, and they track. You cannot bring uh, bees into the state of Alabama without that being inspected. So. But if so. you go backyard, huh? Right. You're in the state. You don't have to go through all that. That's just crossing, crossing, right. That's just crossing the border from Georgia to Alabama and from Alabama to Georgia. If you're moving bees across state lines, then you have all that. If your bees are within state, then you don't have. And say, we've had some influence of African eyes on, on our hive and we worked with it. And we got a lot of honey from that box and we wish we had those that African eyes back because that, that, that was our most productive. But now we, when they chased us, they chased us, they chased us much further than the European bee when they chased us away. But like I say, they do everything more aggressively, not just attack, but they make honey more aggressively. They clean each other, which is critical to surviving pests and parasites is that cleaning mechanism. African eyes bee just does that better. So it's, it's chances of survival are that much greater. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.